Go ahead and be seated. Thanks for being here today. Uh, like I said earlier, we find ourselves in the second Sunday of the season of Pentecost. And this particular year, we do something a little bit different every year. This particular year, we're not looking so much at the characteristics or uh, the characteristics of the Spirit uh, themselves or, or the characteristics that the Spirit employs or empowers in each of us as much as we are looking at the character of the work of the Spirit. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. The first is this. Our hope is throughout this uh, season to dispel the binary thinking related to the spirit, which is that the spirit is either dramatic or dead. Those are the two ways that the the church typically talks about the spirit. The church is either working in these big, wild, dramatic ways. So think about the actual event of Pentecost, like tongues of fire falling from from the heavens and people speaking in all these different languages, um, which is by no means outside the realm of possibility for the spirit but in many ways is an anomaly or something that the Spirit does with occasion, not necessarily with the regularity that you would expect to see um, from something, uh, from from a being that's working on a regular basis with people. The other, uh, uh, kind of the other end of the spectrum is that the Spirit of God is dead. Like, you know, this is kind of like a cessationist view, like the Spirit of God is really not doing anything. The Holy Spirit isn't really actively working in our lives. You know, uh, that, that was sort of like, uh, at Pentecost, that, that responsibility was sort of passed off to us, and now we're responsible for carrying these things out. And I don't think that either of these things are true a- at all. That isn't to say, again, that it can't be dramatic or that the Spirit is sometimes uh, sort of taking a step back, but, but rather that it's the full spectrum. The Spirit of God is working in every element of our lives, and you're going to see in just a minute in the text that the Spirit works in a lot of ordinary ways as well. The second reason that we're in this is because we often say that our church exists uh, to help you join God in the work that he's doing in the lives that you're living, whether it's in work or at home or in your neighborhood or whatever it is. The problem is, is you can't really join God in the work that God is doing unless you are able to identify the work that God is doing. And so it's good for us to pause every now and then and remind ourselves, what are the characteristics of God's work? Like, how do I know when I see something taking place, uh, whether it's a pattern over the course of time or one particular event, uh, event how, how do I know, like, that's something that God's doing? And so in identifying the character of the work of the Spirit of God, we are able, therefore, to join in the work of the Spirit of God. So. Um, I, this quote, I think, kind of sets the stage for not only our time together this morning, but really for the, um, for the series as a whole. This is Pope Francis. Um, he says this about the Spirit. He says, to put it simply, the Holy Spirit bothers us because he moves us. He makes us walk. He pushes the church to go forward. And we are like Peter at the Transfiguration. Ah, how wonderful it is to be here like this all together. But don't bother us. We want the Spirit to doze off. We want to domesticate the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that's not good because he's God and he is the wind which comes and goes and you don't know and you don't know where. He's the power of God. He's the one who gives us consolation and strength to move forward, but to move forward and his brothers and this brothers, this, sorry, this bothers us. It doesn't brother us. It bothers us. It's also (laughs) much nicer to be comfortable. It is so much nicer to be comfortable. The, the Spirit of God, the work of the Spirit, is sometimes better categorized or sometimes better understood as a verb than a noun. The Spirit of God is working and moving, and it works in us and moves us in a particular direction, and sometimes that is uncomfortable. Sometimes it is difficult for us to follow the Spirit. It would be easier for us to define the work of the Spirit or define the Spirit themselves as sort of a, a noun, like a stagnant being that we can identify. We can kind of write down these characteristics in a bullet point form, but the Spirit of God is like a wind moving and changing shape and sometimes difficult to catch and sometimes hard to identify. And we want to make it clearer throughout this season what that work actually looks like. Today, um, we're going to be in a text that is sort of unique. It's a a text that um, I would like to just read to you in its entirety because I believe that all of the points that the text is trying to make are found in the entirety of the story from beginning to end. And it's a fairly short book, so I could theoretically do that, but it would take up a little bit too much time, and I think that um, you could probably read this story on your own. The book that we're going to be in today, the story that we're going to be in, is the book and the story of Ruth. It's a fascinating story um, that I'm not going to be able to talk about nearly all the stuff that I want to from the book of Ruth today. Um, It's maybe a conversation for another time, or maybe I'll come back to it or something like that, because there's so much stuff I had to leave on the cutting room floor, um, unfortunately, with this story. But we're going to do the best we can to use the story of Ruth to better understand the characteristics of the work of the Spirit so that we're able to join in it when we see it. We're going to begin with a short reading, and then I'm going to do a summary as best I can, crash course through the rest of the thing. So 
Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. And they were, and they were a path. Paph- sorry, Epaphrodites and, uh, from, Bethlehem, from Bethlehem, Judah. A lot of words there, my bad. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women named, Op- named Orpah and Ruth. After they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malone and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard... When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and she set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. This is a message from the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a few things that you'll notice in this text as you're reading through it, and if you were to read the entirety of the book of Ruth, or if you like, have any memories from it because you've read it before, there's a few things that, that it were sort of set out with at the very beginning of this. And the first is this. Naomi basically has a, a death sentence sort of pronounced upon her. She is in a, a particular life situation that she may not have survived had there not been some significant changes that were made. Some, some significant obedience on her part or some courage on her part. She may not have made it through because um, she goes to a foreign land, which makes her an immigrant, and her husband, not long after moving there, passes away. And that put her in a very difficult situation. There was absolutely no feminine empowerment at that time. There was really no way for her to like make an income or have a living or to really do anything for herself. She needed a man in order to do those things for her. Well, she was in luck because she had two sons, and those two sons were adults, and they were married, and they were living there with her, and so she had a fallback plan. So despite being a widow and an immigrant, she had a fallback plan, but then those two sons die, and now she's in real trouble, and she's in trouble for a couple of reasons. She's an immigrant, an immigrant she's a widow, and, and now she is also without the support of her sons, and she has to take on uh, the responsibility of her daughters-in-law. You see, in marriage at that time, to, to be married, two people to be married together was for the entire family to say, this whole unit is now our responsibility. And so this, this matriarch in the family is now responsible not only for herself in dire straits, but also for her daughters-in-law, who are also now uh, wi- uh, widows themselves and themselves also orphans because the patriarch has now passed away in the family. So you have two women who are widows and orphans, and you have one woman who is an immigrant and a widow. And they're all supposed to take care of each other somehow. Well, Naomi has heard that in, in this other land, in the land that she is from, the land of the Israelites, that God provides for his people. And so she says, we're going to pack up and we're going to go there, which would have been a dangerous journey. It would have been frightening and it would have taken a tremendous amount of courage for a woman in her situation and a woman of her age to make that journey. But she makes that trek. And about halfway through, she has a moment of uh, lapse, I guess, in her faith or in her confidence in the plan. And she turns to her two daughters-in-law and she says, you should go back. This was a bad idea. I'm going to keep going, but you really shouldn't put yourself through this. You should go back to where you're from, which is Moab. And Orpah says, okay, and she goes back, and Ruth says, no. And this is where there's that famous line from the book of Ruth, where, where you go, I will go. Where you die, I will die. Your people will be my people, et cetera, et cetera. And she commits herself to being with Naomi, no matter what, through thick and thin. They arrive in Judah. They arrive in their hometown. Um, and another, another uh, thing happens, another, another moment of memory or a no- moment of sort of like a rumor circulating hits Ruth this time. So the first rumor that brought them there was that God provides for his people in general, and that sets Naomi off. The second one is this. Ruth hears, well, it is part of the Hebrew law that I, as an immigrant, am allowed to glean from the outer edges of the field. Okay, so if you imagine like a square acre, and imagine it's all crops, rows and rows and rows of crops. Uh, somebody who was law-abiding in that time was to only harvest what was on the interior of that crop, and they would allow the exterior to go un, um, unharvested, and then immigrants or people who were passing through nomads were able to glean from the outside of the crop for free. That was in, written into the Hebrew law. 
Na- Ruth, Ruth hears this and says, okay, well, this, I'm going to go try this out. And she ends up gleaning from this one particular field. Well, as she's doing this, she meets the, the patriarch of this particular field, this particular town. His name is Boaz. And they kind of hit it off, right? Like they are attracted to each other. They're having a good time. They're chatting. They're flirting, whatever. They both swipe right. Everything goes really well in the relationship. And uh, I'm going to like cut through a whole bunch of stuff right now. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, Ruth finds herself not only in a relationship with another person, but in relationship with the patriarch of the town, somebody who has a tremendous amount of influence. She goes and tells Naomi, and Naomi goes, hey, this is actually really great because this guy has family ties to your husband. This guy has family ties to my husband, both of whom have passed. And, and then for the third time, Naomi catches on to a sort of a, a relic of the past, a rumor, a thing that was a part of the law of God that oftentimes had been forgotten. And it's this, this word that you'll see throughout the book of Ruth. It's a hyphenated word. It's either kinsman redeemer or guardian redeemer. And the reason why it's kind of a clunky term and it's got the hyphen in there is because we have nothing like this word in the English language. In fact, we don't even have the concept embedded into the English culture. The English-speaking world doesn't really have an idea of how this would actually play out in our life. So we have this kinsman redeemer, and Naomi goes, you know what? He's a kinsman redeemer. He's a kinsman redeemer. He has a responsibility by law to actually care for you uh, as his, you know, rela- his relative's uh, widow. He has a responsibility by law to care for you. And she sends Ruth, and she says, I want you to go and act on this. So you're going to go and basically, you're going to do everything that a man would typically do in a relationship, At that time, you're going to go and pursue Boaz. And then Boaz is hopefully going to respond kindly and not kill you because by law, I think he could probably do that as well. And he's going to respond kindly and he's going to receive you and he's going to make you his wife. And and therefore, our family lineage is going to carry on and you're going to have care and I'm going to have care. Wild, ridiculous plan. At one point, towards the beginning of the book, actually, um, Naomi shows up in Judah and she calls herself. She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter but it has a second meaning and it's rebel. And there's kind of, I kind of wonder, I'm like, is she just bitter and sad or is she like an anarchist? And she's ready to just like topple the whole thing when she shows up in Judah. I don't, I don't know which it is, but either way, she does exactly that. And she sends Ruth off to, to pursue this man and to, to woo him essentially. Um, and, and I'm, again, I'm gonna skip a whole lot of stuff. And at the end of the story, they, uh, they both commit themselves to each other they marry each other, they have a son, and there's a very short genealogy at the end of the book of Ruth. And it shows how this son that they have, um, it, it, you can draw a direct genealogical line from this son that they have to Jesse, who is the father of David. So for the Jewish people, this has tremendous implications. Ruth, this Moabite woman who's not an Israelite, becomes the great-grandmother of King David. And then for Christians, it has even larger or at least longer implications because we can draw a direct genealogical line through other genealogies throughout the Bible from David to Jesus. So this entire story is this incredibly important link in the chain that leads us from this, you know, this, um, this situation where we have women who are immigrants and widows and orphans who are able to um, sort of inject themselves into this storyline that otherwise they would have been completely left out of. And in doing so, They become a part of the story of David and they become a part of the story of Jesus. And it's because of this. They were able to identify the work of the Spirit in this other place and they were willing to do everything, hell or high water, to risk it all in order to join in on that. And the thing that they identified in these three different kind of vignettes, this one where first Naomi remembers that God provides for his people generally, second, Ruth hears that she can glean from the crops, and then third, um, Ruth is reminded, uh, sorry, Naomi is reminded that there is a kinship redeemer sort of classification uh, that is, that is uh, stipulated in the law. In all of these little vignettes, we hear this, that the Spirit of God is in the business of empowering and elevating people from pe- places of lo- from low places, from lowly places, from difficult places, from places of struggling. This is what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God elevates and empowers. The Spirit of God elevates and empowers. This is the work of the Spirit. This is one of the ways that they identify that, and then they step into it. 
Now, typically the way that the story of Ruth is taught and the way you probably experience if you've done a Bible study on Ruth or something is really focused primarily on Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. And there's sort of this like pre-Christ um, sort of signpost to the Messiah uh, version of that because Christ did exactly the same thing, right? Christ risked it all and gave it all in order to care for a people that was not his. So to give himself so that the, the gospel could go to the Gentiles, right? Very similar storylines. I also think as I've been reading this, I think that maybe Ruth was also like kind of a, a messianic um, precursor, but that's a really half-baked idea and I haven't really fleshed that out yet, but you know me. I like to let you in on the stuff that I'm like mulling over. So anyway, read it and tell me what you think. I don't know. Um, the Spirit of God is in the business of empowering and elevating. This is what the Spirit does. And what that means for you and I is that we can have the same sort of lens on life that Naomi and Ruth had. We can be looking for opportunities to identify the Spirit of God moving people, institutions, individuals, groups, whatever it is, in that particular direction. There's a model that I've been using for this for a couple of years, and, and it's something that our staff and our elders have utilized on occasion, and um, it's been really personally helpful for me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you now, and um, we're going to put it on the screen. I, uh, it, it's pretty high tech. Um, these lines and, and words, I, it took me a lot longer to create this than it should have. Um, this is what we refer to as a two-by-two, two, and sometimes it can be a really helpful way for understanding movement from one place to another. So um, we have resources on the vertical axis and power on the horizontal axis. Um, and and you, can, you can take this, and you can actually sort of plot yourself on this map, if you will, or on this graph. And I highly recommend you do that. It's kind of an interesting process. It could be really kind of like frustrating for you because you might find yourself like, well, I don't really have a lot of resources. I don't really have a lot of power. Or it could be really encouraging to you and, and you might see, find like, oh, I actually have a tremendous amount of one or the other or a lot of one or the other. I'll, a lot of times I think one of the reasons why we get bogged down in our conversations around privilege is because what we're really talking about is something that's a little more multidimensional, something like this. When we talk about privilege just in general, it's hard for people to get their head around what privilege actually is, whether it's you know white privilege or male privilege or education privilege or monetary privilege, whatever it is. Um, really what it breaks down to is something a little more multidimensional like this. And, and in, in the story that we experienced, the story that we just kind of walked ourselves through, Ruth and Naomi uh, were in the bottom left-hand quadrant. And because they joined in the work of the Spirit, they and the people around them too, this didn't just affect them. Um, like I said in the genealogy, this becomes clear. They are moved up and to the right. Up and to the right. Now, this doesn't always like function this nicely. Like it doesn't always just like work where like we join the work of the spirit and then everybody gets to experience this kind of up and to the right where we, everybody has more power and more resources and that kind of thing. But in general, at a very base level, this is what the spirit of God is doing. The Spirit of God in our day-to-day -day reality is working in those situations where you see somebody experience empowerment and elevation. Somebody moving from a place where they have less or they have not, and they get to move into a place where they do have. Now, I'm not talking about a massive extreme where you go from like total poverty to extreme riches. That certainly does happen, but that, that isn't what I mean. What I mean is motion. Remember, that's the point. The destination isn't the point. Whether or not somebody ex ends up with a ton of power and a ton of wealth, that's, that's really not the point at all. It's the Spirit of God moving us in that particular direction. And the call for us as Christians is to find where that is happening and to jump in. Let me give you an example of where that's happening here. Um, there's an organization here in Inglewood called Cross Purpose. Uh, it was kind of north of the city, and they've got a second location here, and they're about to open up a third location in somewhere. Kara, you probably know. Arvada, that's it, okay, uh, about to open a third location, and their, their, their entire uh, uh, purpose uh, is, to, is to help elevate people out of poverty. So they, they identify people who are living in poverty, and it's usually because of some sort of, um, sort of, sort of employment situation, and, and they are able to train them and mentor them and get them into much better paying jobs and move them up and to the right, move them out of a position of, of difficulty and struggle and move them to a position, not again, not like, they just skyrocket into the CEO position and then they have all the wealth and all the power. That's not the point. It's movement in that direction. Uh, there is a location for Cross Purpose here in our city, here in Inglewood. And there's tremendous opportunity for us to get involved. To me, that is a place that the spirit of God is at work. And the reason why I know that is because that is a place where there's empowerment and elevation. We can jump in and start with that if, that is, if you're looking for a place to do that. In the past, our church has been very vocal and participating in participating 
participating in city council meetings, which is like literally across the hall. It is such an honor and a privilege. I feel like, I mean, like if we bore, if you bore a hole through the ceiling here, you end up in like the city manager's office, okay? And then you walk out that way, and that's the courts, and that's uh, our city hall or our uh, city council chambers. Um, there's a tremendous amount of important stuff that happens in this building. And a lot of it, I think, is the work of the Spirit. And we can participate in that by sometimes showing up and being a voice for the voiceless. Now, there's a, a recent policy group that was formed and a recent policy that was passed um, in the Tri-Cities area between Inglewood and Sheridan and Littleton. And if you dial things back years and years and years ago, that all started with a handful of pastors showing up to the Inglewood City Council meetings and say, we are overlooking our homeless population. We don't really care about them. There is nothing in place to care for them. And we are doing nothing to actually help elevate them out of the position that they're in or to care for them at least in the position that they're in to hopefully elevate them as well. That started there in that chamber over there with a handful of pastors showing up and being a voice for the voiceless in city council chambers. And now there's an entire policy, an entire law essentially written um, and funding and all kinds of stuff that's going to work to that end. It takes years sometimes, but it's movement, right? It's movement from, from bottom left to upper right. I could go on and on. I think we can, we can do a lot as the church, as Christians, to protect kids in schools. I think we can stand up against discrimination. Many of people in our church are participating in foster care, which doesn't just help and care for the children and help elevate and empower them, but it also does the same for their biological parents if the parents are willing to participate in that. There's so many ways for us to participate in the things that God is doing, that the work of the Spirit is doing to move people from bottom left to upper right, to experience elevation and empowerment. The question is, when we identify the work of the Spirit in our life, whether it's, as Jared said last week, in moving us from chaos to peace, or in this case, moving people from um, difficulty and lowliness to empowerment and elevation, when we identify it, will we take that step into it? The purpose of our church, our hope at least for you, is that we would empower you and encourage you to join in the work of the Spirit when you're able to identify it. So keep your eyes out. Keep your eyes open and your ears open for the ways that the Spirit is working and step into that when you have the opportunity to do so. I'll leave you with this quote from Anne Lamott. I found it to be refreshing. This is the work of the Holy Spirit and our operating instructions to be the cooling breezes to sad or worried people, including ourselves, in this sometimes hot, stuffy joint. It's a lot cooler in here than, <laughs> than it was last week when we were outside. Um, some of you are without air conditioning because we live in Colorado, and I remember a day like when I was a kid where you just had to suck it up for a couple of weeks, and it was fine. But when you think more figuratively about this, the hot, stuffy joint that we find ourselves in in the world and that a lot of other people find themselves in in their experiences, the work of the Spirit is a cooling breeze, an alleviation. It is a salve on a wound. It helps elevate and empower people in difficult places. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the way that your word continues to expose itself to us and show itself to us in a way that changes the way we live. I, I feel like I've read the Bible a thousand times at this point, and then I keep seeing stuff that feels new and yet ancient at the same time. God, I pray that we would continue to have eyes to see and ears to hear um, what, the, what the Bible says about who you are and what you're doing, but also what is happening in our actual communities, around our dinner tables, in our schools, in our places of work, on our streets, in our businesses, whatever it is. Teach us to see and hear and join. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.